Good morning. And Good morning. welcome to the Alliance Church. Yeah. Bless them. Bless us with rain this morning. Did everybody get rain? Would you stand with us, please? And we're going to praise him in the... Wait a minute. What song is this? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down. Love him, love him. Love him in the morning, love him in the noon. Love him, love him, love him when the sun goes down. Praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the noon. Praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun goes down. We're going to serve him. Serve him, serve him. Serve him in the morning, serve him in the noon. Serve him, serve him, serve him when the sun goes down. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified in my life. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the rain. Thank you for the opportunity to gather with all our friends, our, our brothers and sisters, and sing your praises. We come to you tonight, today humble by the fact that each one of us has our own problems and you're aware of all of them and that you're here with us forever and ever. We ask you to be with the ones who couldn't make it today. Be with the ones that sometimes taking care of those people, Lord. Caregivers are angels in disguise. Be with the truckers. Be with the people on the road. Be with Jeremiah as he gives the message today. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good morning. All right. All right. That's enough. Really? <laughs> 
Stop loving each other. Knock it off. We're not allowed to. Yeah. No, there's only, only so much love. I know. <laughs> All right. Well, I hope everyone's doing good. We got a little bit of rain, right? Now we get the humidity, which is always fantastic. When people say, you know, they always say, oh, Arizona's a dry heat. Yeah, until it's not. And then it's just it's still hot, hot and muggy. And, it's still hot. Yeah. Well, at least at least it is cooler. Um, and it was nice to have a little bit of, what is that called? Sprinkles? We need a good rain, like just dump on us. You know, I, I need a good rain so I can figure out if all my leaks are fixed. So. <laughs> At the house, so. um. Okay, well that's good to know. See, so much. To um, that, huh? Yeah. Yeah. When, uh, yeah. So, anyways, um, so we like to celebrate each other. Um, anyone have a birthday from last last Monday to today? Okay, Phil. Tomorrow, Philip. Okay. See, that's okay. Philip. She needs his glasses. Stand up, Philip. Hey, I sh- you share my birthday. My birthday's tomorrow yeah. too. Yeah. But we're not okay. We're not celebrating hers. Nope, not till because next it's Sunday. not till next Sunday. Next that we Sunday. Celebrate. Don't say that. Nope. <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah. God's in charge. <laughs> All right, let's Happy see. birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Phil. Yeah, all right. Well, God bless you, Phil. Thank you for letting us sing to you. Uh, Phil does so much in our community. Um, and today he's going to be moderate, moderating, uh, hopefully a debate, and hopefully it doesn't get out of control. So, oh boy! Yeah, he did. He so, did a good job. God bless you. I pray this year is even better Happy for you birthday. and your wife. And birthday partner. Yeah. Hey, stop talking back there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have a great little trip. So, God bless you. Um, how about anyone anniversaries um, that we can celebrate? No, no anniversaries. All right. No? Okay. All right. So as Jim comes on up, um, there are these. They just got dropped off. We get them every two years. Um, They're a voter's guide um, just with different things. Um, People are asked questions, and then they give you a little information about how those people answered those. They're at the information table, so it's the blue table on to the left, or when you come in, it's to the right. Uh, it's a short one. There we go. Um, so yeah, so it's for you, you shorter people. Um, but yes, so that so that's out there. So you can take one. Uh, they're free. Um, we got them free, so you can have them free. And they're just for the primary elections, which are on August second. So real votes matter. Yeah. Yes, real votes. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Are you happy to be here? So am oh, I. this is all state stuff, not local. So, oh, if okay. you want lo- local stuff, I think the Patriot Press did did something similar to this. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there's not very many announcements. Uh, Monday's closed. Tuesday tops are still meeting. Are they still going strong? As strong as we can during the summer. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> How many people do you have coming? Six and a dog. <laughs> okay, your dog. Well, you need to you need to fatten that dog up a little bit. Ours is the same way. So, okay, never, okay, moving on. Tuesday, tops meet. Okay, Friday, Teen Rec Night, 6 p.m. Sound booth training on Saturday at 10 a.m. If you have a desire to get into the broadcasting. Um, <laughs> Business profession, uh, come on out and you will receive some of the highest training you can get <laughs> here. 
And a what? I don't have time. Okay. Um, no service tonight. Um, that's about the size of it. Anybody else have anything you want to bring up? Are they going? Are they going fishing? Is that what? What kind of debate do they use? Fishy. <laughs> Let's, this is a church. We need to be a little more <laughs> reverent. We need to smile. How many? How many muscles does it take to smile? Fourteen or so. How many does it take to frown? About twenty-eight. What does God want you to do? He wants you to be happy, okay? Um, That's about the size of it, so let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for that mighty and awesome grace that you give so freely through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing that salvation we have through Jesus Christ. Father, just pray now that as we go into the rest of the service, you open Jeremiah's heart to preach the gospel as he knows it best. And, Lord, just thank you so much for him. And, uh, Father, open our hearts, too, that we can receive that word with thanksgiving and draw near to you. Thank you for your love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. Amen. All right, so the debate that Margaret was talking about, that's going to be at the community center at 2 o'clock. Community center is over at the park um, off of Chandler and right north of Quell. Okay, so uh, if you know where the the planes are, that's where it is. Okay, so you'll see a bunch of cars out there. I saw last week as um, people were coming in, there was a uh, the guy that did the the Captain Morgan um, yeah. signs. Like he was putting signs up as they're going in. I'm like, oh, yeah. that's the way to do it, I guess. Yeah. Um, so in in the cliches, everyone knows what a trope is. Like uh, a trope in cinema would be like uh, the bully's always the jock. Okay, a trope in um, would be like uh, the bad guys. Like in the old west, trope was uh, the bad guys always wore black hats. The good guys always wore white. Right, um, and so there's a trope for bad dreams. Uh, what do you think the trope is? Like if someone had a bad dream, what was that trope? Anyone know? Being naked in front of a crowd. Have you ever seen those that trope? And I've never dreamed it either. But in in movies, that's always the trope, right? Like I've always seen um, like in high school drama, you know, shows. They always go. Uh, there, there's always that one time when the one of the main characters wakes up and they're in their underwear and they have to give a speech, you know, and um. But I always thought that was a really funny trope because I've never like had that yeah. dream. Uh, have you? <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. I've heard that where you, you like to overcome public public speaking, you want to view everyone else in their underwear, which is weird. Like, that makes me more uncomfortable. <laughs> like, you know, because I've had people tell me that too. I'm like, I just, I'll, I'll picture everyone with their clothes on. Thank you. Uh, that's it's just, it's weird. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but this trope of, like, not having clothes on when you're in front of people, it's just weird to me that that is something that's in cinema. Um, but clothes are a huge deal in our in our society. It's really funny here in courts. I I never knew of any nudists, and um, I knew of nudists. I knew of like beaches that were supposed to be nude, um, but I never knew nudists until I came to courtsite. Um, and there um, um, there are several. Um, but I find it funny that south of town there's a, a nudist camp. Um, so don't go looking for us, weirdos. Uh, 
<laughs> but um, but they have signs up, and so it's just it's interesting because clothes are so important to our society, right? Um, I was just thinking about you know how important clothes are. I I ran across a couple of quotes. One person's like, um, "Your style is how you speak without speaking," you know. Um, another person said, "People are going to look at you. Might as well give them something to talk about." Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, um, um, and I love some of, um, uh, during um, Easter we had Lucy and Vera, and I told them this that I just loved the way they dressed on Easter. They were like the 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 old lady church. Um, like when if you've ever been to an old time country church. The ladies with the big hats, yeah. And I just loved it when Lucy and Vera were, uh, they had those hats. and It was just great. Um, but um, I was thinking about this, about fashion and everything, you know, because I'm very fashionable. Um, and so you're either laughing because you're saying, oh, you're, <laughs> it's like you're, uh, anyways, um, but... But did you know that the, in the fashion indu- industry, they boast that they have 3 billion workers worldwide? Like, I didn't, I didn't realize that so many people worked in the fashion industry. Maybe not. Maybe they're just overblowing it. But they're also, they, the fas- fashion industry is worth $3 trillion. Like, that's a lot of money. And that if, to put that into perspective, that's 2% of the global GDP. Like, just clothes. So clothes are pretty important to us, right? Um, and so this idea of clothing and wearing the right clothes is what kind of what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 and 22 today. Um, we're going to be looking at three parables that Jesus taught, and one of them has to deal with, guess what? Clothes, right? Wearing the right clothes. And so... As you open up to Matthew 21, uh, let's talk about where we are in the last couple weeks because we're in our final section of Matthew. And in Matthew, this section, we started off with talking about how as disciples, if we're going to follow Jesus, that we need to be satisfied with whatever Jesus gives us. A lot of times we look at the world and we, we look at the, the grass being greener on the other side. Um, one time I heard someone say, you know why that is, right? It's because they have a septic problem. That's why the grass is greener over there. Um, and so sometimes the grass looks greener, but it's not, you don't want to actually go over there because it's, it's worse. Um, but we can be unsatisfied with what we have. And when we do that, what we're saying to God is, God, you're not good enough. Now, what I, what we didn't talk, what we didn't say was this idea of we, you know, we need to want more of God, but whatever he gives us, that's what we should be satisfied with. And sometimes he gives us, you know, certain situations that we need to be satisfied with, certain um, people we have to be satisfied with, certain um, financial situations, and we have to say, okay, God, if this is what you're going to give me, then I'll be satisfied with it. But sometimes God's like, well, you actually have to do something, right? Um, so you actually have to go out and work and do these things. But whatever God gives us, we need to be satisfied with. So that's what we talked about the two weeks ago. Last week, we talked about this idea that as disciples, we should always be seeking the will of God, that that is our number one priority. It's not our will. It's not our desires. It's not me. Um, in fact, I'll, I'm going to give you a little um, taste of something. So this past week, I took the teens to the Navajo Nation. Uh, it w- did not end good. But, spoiler, it did not end good. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit later why. Um, but there was a lot of me focus, self-focus, not me, me, but personal, like I am being attacked here. It's about me. Things are about me. And that caused a lot of problems. Um, and so this idea of I seek God's will, not my will, actually helps me be satisfied in whatever happens. Because if I'm seeking God's will, then God, this car is yours. God, this clothes are yours. God, this job is yours. God, this is yours. And if God says, well, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that away, we're okay with that because it was never ours to begin with. It was, God, this is yours. So I'm satisfied, God, if you give it to me or if not give it to me or whatever. I'm satisfied with it. 
because it's your will, it's not my will. And so that's what we kind of talked about last week. So we're at this point where we're understanding as disciples we need to be satisfied, as disciples we need to follow God's will. But in the greater context of what's going on, we're talking about the authority of Jesus. That Jesus' authority is on full display in the, in, the, in the sections that we've been reading through these last three weeks. And it's because Jesus has authority that we need to be satisfied. It's because Jesus has authority that we need to follow his will. And so it's, that's what our focus on. So when we come back into Matthew in chapter 21, we're at this point where Jesus has shown his authority through the triumphal entry, through the cursing of the fig tree, through the overturning of the tables at the uh, temple. And then last week we saw his authority being challenged right, by the Pharisees. And so we see all his authority on full display. And now we're going to see this, this authority in the parables. Okay? So we're going to read these three parables. We're going to read them one at a time and talk about them um, as we go through. So Matthew 21, starting in verse 20, um, where are we, 28. Here we go. Jesus starts speaking this parable. What do you think? There was a man who has two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two sons, which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So let's just stop right there. What's interesting about this whole section is when I, you know, the first time I read this years ago, um, I was reading this and I go, you know what? Neither one of those guys did what the father asked. Um, because we, so what me and my wife teach our children is that first time asked is obedience. So when we ask and you do it, that's obedience, right? But if we ask and ask again, you are disobedient. Does that make sense? And so that's what we teach our children that that's first time ask is obedience. And so, but in the context Jesus isn't just talking about just obedience. But he's taking this because we have to put everything into the context of what's going on. And it's dealing with these Pharisees, these, these teachers and these religious leaders. And so what happens just prior to this is Jesus is questioned. His authority is a question. And so he gives this question back. If you remember from last week, where did John's baptism come from? Is it heaven or from man? What Jesus was trying to do is, where does John's authority come came from? Where did that come from? So that they could understand where Jesus' authority comes from. Okay, that was the the whole point of that. But they decided we we don't know, right? They said we don't know. The reason why is because they figured if we go one way, he'll say why don't why don't we follow? But if we go the other way, the people are going to get mad. So they just said we don't know. That way. They're good either way, right? And so, but Jesus responds, then I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you where my authority is if you're not going to make a decision, right? And so this parable comes right after that. And so he says, two sons. Okay, so here's a dichotomy. He's saying, there's these two people. The father goes to one and asks them, hey, in the back, you guys need to not be talking. I'm folding around. So, there's this dichotomy. There's these two sons. So Jesus says, the father says to the oldest son, son, go do this. And the son says, no. But then he goes and does it. The second son says, yeah, I'll do it. But he doesn't. So the point here is not so much obedience, but the response. Because he connects it back to John, right? He talks about in the last part, he says, um, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes entered the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the, the righteousness, the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. 
So who's which son? He connects the prostitutes and the tax collectors, which basically is just uh, the social terminology for the sinners. So he connects the sinners with the first son who didn't obey, but eventually did, with the Pharisees and the le- religious leaders who say they will do it, but then don't. So what's going on here? What's really going on is you have these people who are following, right? They're going to accept they're accepting the master's call, but they didn't do it at first, right? The father says, do it. God says, here are my commands, follow them. Okay? Do you see the parallel so far? The sinners don't, right? The tax collectors, the prostitutes, they don't. They go and they live, they choose the sinful life. But now, when John comes, when Jesus comes, what are those sinners doing? They're coming. They're following. They're responding to God. Do we see the parallel? Do we see where Jesus is going with this? But what about the second son? The second son says, yeah, Dad, I'll do it. These are the religious leaders. Yeah, we'll do it, God. Yeah, we'll do the commands. But they don't. They don't actually follow. They say the right things. They they dress the right way, but they're not actually following God. And this is what Jesus is trying to get at. It's better to follow through than to say you're going to and not. And lip service is a huge thing. Because one of the things I think that we miss in our Christian life is, okay, if I... If I play the role, right? If I dress the certain way, if I say the certain things, then God's happy. But that's not what God's happy with, right? God's happy when we, we follow Him, when we trust Him, when we do what He says, not just look the part. And that's the huge thing. And this is what Jesus is getting at to these religious leaders. Because they're not, they're so afraid that if they accept Jesus' authority, that they would have to actually follow. Or they're so afraid of the people that they're not going to you know, say that, oh, John was just some other guy. Because why? They, they want their own, we talked about this several times over the last weeks, they want their own kingdom. They don't want Jesus' authority. They don't want to follow God's will. They want their own. And so Jesus is saying, those tax collectors, those prostitutes, those sinners, they're the ones that get the kingdom, not you. And so we go into the second one, because Jesus is building on this idea in his second parable. So dropping down to verse 33, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press, in it and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time, uh, came, uh, sorry, when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They, they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the, the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring, he will bring those wretches, wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the Scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. 
All right, so you have a second parable. parable. You have the first one, two sons, right? That the sinners are coming to God, right? But the religious leaders are not. And then Jesus kind of puts a parable. He basically takes the history of Israel and puts it into a parable. Because if we look back throughout the, the Old Testament, throughout the history of Israel, you have God who, who brings the people of Israel to Israel, to the land of um, this, is supposed to, it, the Old Testament calls it the land flowing with milk and honey. This is supposed to be a great place. But it's not just a place that's really nice. Because um, it's not just that. It's a place where Israel would be a, the center focus of the nations. Right? So there's this road called the King's Highway that goes right through Israel. It connects the Mediterranean, uh, the, the northern half, to Africa through, through the land. And so you have to go through Israel to get anywhere if you're going to go by land. Because you're not going to go through Arabia. It's a giant desert. So you need to go through this area, and Israel is that point. So God makes Israel... He pulls them to this place where they're going to be not just where they can be sustained, but where God's going to make them a focal point of the nations. So he creates this place for them. And then, so just like the master does with the vineyard. And he puts the Israelites into this place just like the master rents out the vineyard. And just like in the parable... When the people start, so God, in the, in the parable, he goes for his fair share, right? His cut of the, the prophets. But in the history of Israel, it's the covenantal relationship. That Israel entered into a covenant relationship with God. They do this really twice. Um, they renew it in Deuteronomy, and then they renew it again in Joshua. And they, this whole idea that, Israel says we are going to be God's people. So God's people has to do certain things. And certain things, if they don't do it, are going to get other things. And this whole idea of cursings and blessings come from this covenant relationship. So if you do what God says, you get blessed. If you don't, you get cursed. That's just how the covenant works. It's like a treaty. Anyone um, following the whole... Elon Musk buying Twitter thing? Okay. So when you go to buy a company like that, I've never done it. Um, if I did, I have a lot more money. Uh, I, I'll probably still be here because God just won't let me. Uh, but no, the whole idea here is that when you buy this, in these huge companies, you go into this contract. You enter a contract to enter into a contract. And the contract says that if you don't live up to your side of the contract, then you could lose money. So one of the things was, if one side didn't um, live up to the contract, they would have to pay it like a billion dollars. That's, that's a pretty hefty thing for, you know, you're going into this and it's like, yeah, okay, I don't want this anymore. Here's a billion dollars. You know, all of us together could live off a billion dollars for our entire life. You know, and so, but this is this is the penalty, and so in the covenant there are the good things, there are the bad things, and so what the Israelites were doing is they were doing bad, and God would send the prophets, and they would treat them badly. At first they would respond well, they would do what the prophet said, but as time goes by, it gets worse and worse. The prophets get more treated worse and worse. You have someone like um, Jeremiah who gets throw, thrown into the, the broken cistern, which is basically like a porta potty toilet okay, at that point. Because they use broken cisterns to do stuff, and, you, know, you know, excrement. Okay? So he gets thrown in that. You have someone like Isaiah who gets cut in half. You get all these people who start are being treated horrifically and Jesus is using this vineyard parable to say, this is you all. Like, this is the nation of Israel. This is what you've been doing. And so then Jesus gets to the son. The, the master sends his own son. This is, Jesus is just slapping them in the face. This is what's happening. 
This is what Jesus is. Jesus is the Son come. And what do they do to the Son? They kill Him. Which, He's pointing, been pointing to this for the last several chapters, that I'm going to go up to Jerusalem and they are going to crucify Me, but on the third day I'm going to raise. He's been telling His disciples this thing repetitively. And here, in parable form, He's telling them, the Son has come to deal with the nation. But what do they do? They kill the son. So what is the father going to do? What is the master going to do? And the response of the religious leaders seals their fate. They respond to the parable with, well, he's going to take them out. He's going to do wretchedly to these wretches. And then he's going to go find new people and put them in. And Jesus' next words or a quote from the Psalms. The stone the builders rejected has been the capstone. The Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is saying, basically, you're right. And you're rejecting the Son right now. But, but God has done something great here. You've rejected this stone, that it's going to be nothing, but it's going to be the capstone. Everything. So the capstone is that, you know, when you see the arches, right? It's that center V stone. And all the weight of that, that arch is on that stone. And that's what Jesus is talking about. All the weight is on Jesus here. Everything relies on Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. He's talking about himself. And so this idea, so he's talking about this, and he's saying he's going to take it away from you. And this is where the religious leaders get it. They go, this guy's talking about us. He's saying we're going to be rejected. We're the wretched ones. We're going to be sent away. And they go to find a way that they can take him out, but they can't do it now. They will soon. Then we get into the third one. Because I find it interesting. Because, oh, I got one more thing up there, right? So this, this is all pointing towards the Gentiles. And I haven't been doing the, the Scripture things. I've just been skipping them, huh? I'm sorry. I get stuck in a, a pattern of thought and then I forget. So the first one is James. Sorry. First one is James. So from the first parable, it's James. God doesn't want lip service from us. Why? Because he wants us. So this is what James says. I'm sorry. Oh, I messed this up. I had a, a, an interesting week. I'm a little tired. So uh, it says, In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. That is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. This is why our action it means something to God. We can't just say that we believe. We actually have to do what God says. All right? In the second one, Acts uh, 28, at the end of Acts, Paul says to the, to the church at Rome in the Jewish community that's there, that's gathering, to hear him. He says, and I think this is interesting, that's at the end. He says, therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Okay? So this, these people who God is going to bring into the vineyard, isn't just those sinners he talked about, but it's a whole new group, the people that are really unclean, those Gentile people. They're all going to be brought in, new tenants into this vineyard. Okay, so now to the third one. So in the third one, and this is why I think I, it's interesting that this third one comes right here. Because a lot of times we get to, we, I've heard these other two um, spoken about, and then the banquet is separated. But it comes directly after this. As these religious leaders are leaving, right, the people that are being rejected are leaving, there's still people there. And so Jesus goes into another parable about what it means to be those new vineyard, Right? So he, he uses the same idea and he just carries it on. So let's read this one. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some, then he sent some more servants and said to those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner, my ox and fat cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servant went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find with both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed the man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited... But few are chosen. And so you have this very similar um, parable at the beginning, right? You have, so let's take these side by side. You have the vineyard, right? So the vineyard, wedding banquet. Okay? You have the invitation to the wedding guests. You have the tenants, the original tenants of the vineyard. Okay? These are parallels. The vineyard guys didn't do well, and so they're being, they were going to get, be gotten rid of, right? It's the same with the guests who mistreated the servants, okay? So are we, right? We're still there. But now Jesus adds another thing. Now he's talking about those that have, did come, right? He's talking about the new people that are being called to come to the wedding, And so they're called. And where are they called from? Everywhere. Right? And it says both good and bad. Everyone is just being called. And then there's this one guy. And this guy's really important. He is the one without the right clothes. He's come, but he doesn't have the right clothes on. And if you've ever been to a wedding... You know, I always, when I officiate weddings, I always ask them, how do you want me to dress? Okay? Because some people want it formal. Some people want it informal. Right? I do the same thing when I do memorials or funerals. I have one family. I've done, I think, six funerals for this one family. And they want suit and tie. Like, like, and it is open caskets. It's very formal. Um, graveside service, the, very formal. And then there's some are like jeans, T-shirt. We don't care. You know? Yeah, as long as you wear clothes, right? You're not, we're not the nudist camp. Then, so. And the wedding clothes for this society is really a big deal. You dress the way you're supposed to when you go to a wedding. And for this guy not to do that, it doesn't matter where he's from. He knows we don't get to know where he's from, right? We don't know if he's from the highways or the byways or from the, the prestigious area, from the low. It doesn't matter. But he was supposed to be like everyone else, dressed for the occasion. But he wasn't. And I think this speaks volumes because it's not, this parable is not, addressed to the religious leaders. They've already been addressed, right? And they knew it. This is addressed to those people who are being called, that first son, those new tenants. And it's basically saying, be ready. You're being called, so put on the right clothes. And the clothes that we see in Scripture is Christ himself. So in Romans 13, we get this from Paul. Paul writes, um, Rather clothe, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about gratifying the desires of your flesh. Okay? So this idea of we need to be clothed with the goodness of Jesus, with His righteousness, not our own. That His clothes 
putting Him on, meaning we need to accept Him as our Savior. Meaning we recognize, I was the, the prostitute, the, the tax collector. I was the sinner. I am the one that wasn't called to the vineyard, what the Master says, what my Father says. I am called to the banquet. So what do I need? I need my clothes. So as believers, we need to be clothed with Christ. That means we need to accept what He has done for us, that we are sinners, that He died because we couldn't fix that. We couldn't be good enough for God. And so we need to be clothed with Christ. We need His righteousness. And so what does God sees now? He sees a bunch of people at the banquet clothed. Not just in any clothes, but as Jesus. And that's what we need to do. And so I find it interesting that if we separate these, we, we can kind of miss the point of what Jesus is saying. Yeah, he's going after the religious leaders. And that's usually a lot of times we go, yeah, go get them, Jesus. Beat up those, those jerks. But here he comes right at any one of us that says, you need to be ready. You've been called to the, to the banquet. Be ready. Be clothed in Christ. That's a huge thing. And so, so, and how do we do that? God is calling us to a faith that is beyond belief into action. That's a huge thing. A lot of times we get this idea that faith is, is this head knowledge that I have. But the reality is it's an action that we do. It's saying, okay, I trust you, Jesus. Now I will obey. I will do what you say. Because, again, what was the first parable? Two sons. One said they would obey, but they didn't. One said they wouldn't obey, but they did. And which did Jesus except as the right one. The one who said he wouldn't obey, but he actually did it. That's the one whom Jesus accepts. That's the one who's going to get the vineyard. That's the one who's going to be clothed with Christ. So it's accepting by faith and doing by action. Okay. So my challenge for you this week is very simple. Read through these parables again. And ask three questions. They're on the thing more in detail. But just ask three questions. The first one, after you read it, about the two sons, am I being obedient? Jesus, am I being obedient? It, do I say that I'm going to do something and then not do it? Lord, make me obedient. Okay. The second one is the vineyard. God was sending. God, are you speaking to me? And I'm... Rejecting it, right? I'm being those bad vineyard workers. Lord, that could be someone that God sends into our lives. That's most likely the Word of God. It's the movement of the Holy Spirit. God, am I being disobedient and not accepting your correction? And the last one is, am I clothed with Jesus' goodness? This is, if, if you're not, haven't accepted Jesus as your Savior, this is where it comes down to. That, Lord, I accept you because I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve anything, but you died for me because I couldn't do it myself. You love me that much. And it's an acceptance of what God has done and then an actual doing it, right? It's not just, yes, Lord, I'll do it. It's not just, hey, I look good on a Sunday morning, right? Yes, I say the right words. You know, a lot of times we can think, well, if I just don't cuss, then God's happy. If I just wear certain things, then God's happy. You know, and God wants everything of us. 100%. Not just saying that we're going to do it. Actually doing it. It's the rubber meets the road. It's the faith that is shown through action. Alright, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Whew. Thank you for the time that we get to spend in your word, but thank you for this time that we get to be in fellowship with each other. With the, as we come in, we greet each other, and 
find out how each other's week's been. And we can pray for each other. Lord, thank you for that. I thank you for after this when people are, are just, they're so loving towards each other that they just hang around. Lord, I just thank you for that. Yeah. Father, I ask that we would be people who are obedient, that we would be first time obedient, that we would be greater than the son in the parable that would say something and then later do it. Lord, help us to do it that first time so that we can be obedient to you. As as Jesus, you said, to, to love you is to obey your commandments. So let's love you by obeying. So Lord, help us with that. Move in us by your Holy Spirit to achieve that because on our own we can't. Lord, we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. And doggone it, we don't, people just don't like us um, when we're our just sinful selves. So, Lord, be in us. Clothe us to be who you want us to be. That we may honor you with not just our lips, but with our actions and our thoughts as well. So, Lord, move in us this week by your Holy Spirit to accomplish your will. We ask this all in your Son's name. Amen. So we're going to take an offering, but as you guys can take it a little slow, I'm going to tell a story. Um, so I'm going to tell what's going on this week, what happened this week. So this week we took the teens up to the Navajo Nation. It did not end well. Um, I've been doing this for 15 years. Uh, we've been taking teens out of town uh, for this is the first time I've ever had to cut a trip short because of the actions of the teenagers. Um, I believe that it is a spiritual warfare because every time I've gone up to the, the Navajo Nation, there's been spiritual warfare. And I believe that this is what I want to tell you that there was um, some amazing things that happened. So one of those things was we sat for about 30 minutes and Doug, who spoke here, um, yeah, we were at Shanto, and um, he was talking to us about spiritual warfare and and really we talked a long time Ansel and Faye were there with us and um, and I believe that there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on within our teens lives in general specifically during this week um, because it started right away I mean it was just fighting and friends became enemies enemies became friends it was weird and the other thing that was good was that we had this one boy, um, very autistic, and he was having a really hard night. It was the second night, really hard night. Um, and the, the guys surrounded him and slept next to him because they were all spread out in this room. And they all moved their stuff over and slept next to him, which I thought was amazing. It was an amazing thing. But there are times when it just, it, the snowball of problems kept happening. And my prayer is that by cutting it short, 
because they got the work done. They did a fantastic job um, painting this building that we were there to paint. Really good job. I mean, I can't stress how good they did because it was really good. Um, but the reward for that was going to be going to Grand Canyon. We did not go to Grand Canyon because it was such a bad um, thing. Um, so I want to really press on you this morning to be praying for our youth. Okay? The battle isn't just that. That is just the end result. That's the symptom of what's going on in each of these teens' lives. They're all struggling with different things. Um, I could give you backstories on teenagers where lives are just destroyed and they're hurting and they are that these things are a part of it. They're, they're sinners, believe me. And the world around them just continues to pound and to pound on them. And so if I could just press on you to pray for these teenagers, that this wouldn't just be, well, the church is a jerk. They didn't allow us to do it because they're just mean. But instead that they would go, you know what? Maybe we need to stop and think, where is my life headed? Why is this? Why did this happen? And what can I do to change it? And that they would come, and those that don't know Christ, that they would know Jesus as their Savior, and those that do know Jesus, that they would step up and be spiritual leaders to their teenage friends. Okay, so if you could just pray for them, right? Um, because we love them. We don't do these things because we have to, but we do it because we care deeply for them. All right. So we'll take this offering. But that's, I want to share at the offering because this is what the ministry is about. It's about the teenagers. It's about our young families. You know, most of you in here, I know you're believers. You're going to heaven. But there's a lot of people in our town that are not. And the gospel needs to be brought to them through each other, through the, what this ministry does. And so I want to impress on you, be praying. If nothing else, pray for our youth. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us and that you bring us into this community of believers. You do this not by our, us, but by your grand love for us. And so, Lord, we know how deep you, deeply you love the young people of this town, these teenagers and these children. Lord, I pray that breakthroughs would happen, that your Holy Spirit would just bash down walls in these teens' lives, that they would waken to who you are, that for their need for you, that nothing else would matter to them but to know you as Savior. And Lord, I pray for those teens that do know you, that they would stop messing with sin, that they would put it to the side and be be fully engaged with you in their lives. So Lord, we just hand over our teens and our children to you because only in your hands can anything be done. And so Lord, we praise you for you are good. That's the song in Jesus' name. Amen. After all that I've done, Lord, after all, after all that you've forgiven, after all, after the promise.
after all that you've given after all after all that I've taken after all you used to promise a mansion for this lowly soul of mine and I hope that I Stand with us, please, singing. In my heart there rings a melody. Let's go out of this place singing. Well, it's supposed to be a cooler week, right? So get out there. Check on people, by the way. Check on people, you know, your neighbors and such. Uh, make sure they're okay. Um, we were given some money for water. Um, so if you know anyone that needs water, let us know. We'll buy gallons of water and give them out, okay? So if not, we're just going to buy a whole bunch of water and just put it on Facebook that we have water. So um, let us know, all right? So God bless you. Have a great week. Um, if you are a Christian, you have been called, you are a new vineyard worker. So get to work, all right? God bless you. Have a great week. Also, it, like last week, if you could grab a chair and just put it to the side, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And don't forget voter guides.